welcome to the 2020 Brody's Environmental Law Lecture Series. It's great to see so many people here on a cold January evening. Um, tonight is the Charles Smith Memorial Lecture. Um, each year we mark um, the sad passing of Charles Smith, a, a partner of Brody's and a leading uh, force behind the Brody's Environmental Law Lecture Series for, for many years. January 2016, um, and mark that by having a lecture in his name. Uh, and tonight it's a, a real pleasure to have Ben Pontin, a professor of law at Cardiff University, who will be talking um, about a, uh, a thought provoking and possibly controversial topic uh, the British way of environmental protection. And, um, I will see whether we can do it without talking about Brexit. So sit back and enjoy the lecture. Ben, isn't it? It's a pleasure to hook up with you here. And um, James has shown great foresight in, uh, in booking this lecture in for the sort of the day after the withdrawal act received royal assent. So there will be a little bit of Brexit towards the end of this lecture because um, the topic is the British way of environmental protection. And uh, it's, it's, it's something, I've got a couple of props here, a couple of, a couple of books. It's something I've written about in a book published this year called The Environmental Case for Brexit. And the environmental case for Brexit is that there is a British way of environmental protection which is okay. So, um, uh, and uh, the, uh, the, the, this uh, lecture is, is, is focusing on that British way argument as, as a reason why Brexit can be welcomed, can be embraced. So um, I was aware that it could be a little bit controversial and I did ask Phil what, what the sort of politics of the audience would be like and he, he wasn't quite sure. But, um, <laughs> but, uh, but um, I mean, uh, because it is controversial, um, because talking of a British way of environmental protection, well, the term British anywhere has a sort of a mixed cachet. It's a, it's a, a bit of a mixed brand. Um, I've been looking at other um, talk or other conversations about ways. And I remembered um, at UCL, I studied jurisprudence under Bill Twining, William Twining. And he got us to read the Cheyenne way, which is about the relationship between law and other ways of organizing society in a native Indian American um, community in the 1800s. And the Cheyenne way is uh, an oral way. People make their way orally through spoken word, through practice. Um, it's a pre-literate society. Very little is written down. There are law ways, but these law ways work alongside other ways. Um, and it's really not clear what the boundary between law and non-law is. So um, that's why I wanted to um, you know, begin this lecture with a little bit of context about what the British way means in terms of law. Then I'm going to describe the British way, what I understand the British way to mean, uh, what Brian said it to mean. Then I'm going to look at some criticisms of the British way and defend the British way. And finally, I'm going to um, look at the future of the British way. Um, uh, yeah. So my first slide is Monarch of the Glen. It's uh, Edwin Landseer. It's in the Scottish uh, National Gallery, uh, you know, very, very nearby. And the, um, the gallery uh, website describes Monarch of the Glen as one of the most famous British pictures and that it uh, encapsulates the grandeur of Scotland's uh, highlands and wildlife. So I've given you this as a sort of prologue because um, what, what, what role can this have? Uh, what interest can this have to environmental lawyers? Um, I think, you know, I think, I think art is a very, very important part of the ways within which law ways operate. And this is, this is art in the context of the Cheyenne way. So this is the um, British equivalent of the Cheyenne art that you can see here. It's, um, it's, uh, so art is important um, to lawyers because it sets the wider context, the cultural context within which law unfolds. But then there's the, you know, there's the, there's the question, you know, how can this, what makes this British rather than Scottish or English? The artist uh, is, um, was born very near to Westminster. He's a Londoner. Um, you know, so, so what, what, what makes this British? And I think that um, both of the answers to these questions are unclear. 
Uh, there could be relevance to lawyers. We'll try and explore this a little bit today. Um, and it may have nothing to do with British. So hopefully, um, as the talk unfolds, we'll be reflecting a little bit more deeply on what it means to be British in the context of environmental law and what wider culture has to do with us as lawyers, academic and practicing. So if I can move on. So uh, move on to what is the British way of environmental protection? It has an originator. It's the, the, it's the brainchild of Eric Ashby. Eric Ashby was the first chair of the Royal Commission on Environmental Pollution, a uh, post he held between 1970 and 1973. He um, was an academic botanist, a chair, or well, he, was in, he was president of um, Queen's University Belfast, an educator, and uh, an author of a brilliant book called The Politics of Clean Air. He wasn't a lawyer, but he wrote a lot about environmental law. And there's, this, uh, there's a, an obituary in The Independent which uh, captures some of his qualities, qualities he would have been proud to be known by. Benevolent authoritarianism. He was a, a benevolent you know, authoritarian. But he was also a, you know, a participative Democrat. So the British way um, uh, is a little bit like the obituary of its pioneer, Eric Ashby. There is a bit of authoritarianism, there's a bit of benevolence, wisdom, kindness, you know, patrician superiority, and there's a bit of participative democracy, a bit of grassroots stuff from, you know, um, rank and file. So it's, it's very complex, um, but this, uh, th this, is, this is its um, author, if you like, its originator, Lord Ashby, Eric Ashby. Um, and he defined the British way as each case on its merits. That's the British way of environmental protection. Each case on its merits. I'll come on to flesh a little bit of this out in a second in relation to these three themes. But it is simply each case on its merits. And that really only begins to make sense when you think of what, 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 what does that exclude? Surely that doesn't exclude a lot if it's, it doesn't exclude anything if it's each case on its merits. It excludes absolutely plenty of other approaches, other ways. If it's each case on its merits, uh, you are not going to be looking at some broad principles or some specific principles from which you deduce uh, a solution. You won't be looking at much formal law within which you will be guided. If it is each case on its merits, there's something quite spontaneous about it. It is being made up as you go along. And I don't know if there are any practicing lawyers here who identify with that. Um, I'd be very interested in whether there are any regulators here. But um, that is what the British way of environmental protection is. It's a spontaneous, ongoing, practical attempt to solve the problems as they present themselves to the people to whom they're presented. Um, people like Eric Ashby, really, um, looking at um, other uh, you know, more, more uh, on, on the ground regulators. So, um, so yes, yeah, so each case on its merits is, is actually quite potentially distinctive. But anyway, these three aspects of it are worth um, um, you know, uh, unpacking and pulling out. One is that the British way places a lot of emphasis on executive discretion. It will give a government body, a uh, body accountable to the government, uh, an environmental regulator, whether it's you know, SEPA or Natural Resources Wales or the Environment Agency, it will give them discretion um, to identify the problems that matter and to solve them. Uh, the public um, will be involved in this discretionary process because if you're solving practical problems, you, you, you're going to have to you know, draw on all the help you can. So the British way is discretionary and participative. Um, and perhaps this is where the democratic participative dimension of the obituary of um, Ashby comes in. Finally, um, the British way has a, a complex relationship with the law because at one level the law is the last resort. There's not a lot of regulatory law. Um, there can't be because of the importance of discretion. So discretion is not tightly framed by law. It's not heavily circumscribed by specific legal rules. You, know, you are given a broad 
uh, uh, you know, a blank canvas almost as a regulator. Um, but uh, there is common law. There's, there's, there's common law. There's private law. There's, for example, the tort of nuisance. So, uh, so a, a regulator of air um, will know that neighbours um, who are polluted by a factory that they're regulating have common law rights. And uh, that regulator might use those common law rights. Uh, the regulator um, you know, might find them a bit of an inconvenience because it, it, it distracts from their discretion. You know, if, if within the law, the private law is going to be taking over, it could be a bit of a problem for the regulator. So law has a very, very complex role within the British way, and that's a defining feature of the British way, I think. At one level, it's a last resort, and at a level, another level, there's a very strong role um, for private law in which the judges are involved, uh, independent of regulators, almost an unofficial law. So um, hopefully this will um, become a little bit clearer, and the examples I give will, will, yeah, will, will clarify this, and you'll get a strong impression of what the British way is, so that we can then evaluate it and talk about its future. Um, so uh, the example Ashby gave was rivers pollution. Uh, he said that rivers pollution illustrates the British way because, well, you protect rivers by saying that discharges can't go into them unless an executive body says they can, giving that executive body quite a broad discretion as to what can and can't go into it. Uh, regulators tended to adopt a view that the long title of the legislation said that rivers shall be wholesome. So their aim was that rivers shall be wholesome. Um, Applications for consent to discharge stuff that may impact on the wholesomeness of rivers would be advertised and the public could participate. And invariably, they did. Um, fishermen would be particularly um, heavily involved in other immunity organizations. So the, dis the, the consent setting process was participative, uh, what well, is participative. When there's a pollution incident, when there is a significant fish kill, for example, uh, the regulator will not go straight to the law. They will hesitate because the law is the last resort. They will look at the law as something in the background that can be used to negotiate uh, an arrangement with the uh, polluter by which it doesn't happen again. Um, because they will know that the polluter doesn't want to pollute. and They want to maintain good relationships with the regulator. So law is the last resort. But uh, there will be anglers um, and maybe an anglers association like Fish Legal, who are very happy to say, you have interfered with my private rights to um, riparian rights, and uh, we will, um, if it's ongoing, obtain an injunction, unless you do something now, uh, and we want compensation. So there is this complex interplay of regulatory law and private law. Um, so although at one level law is a last resort, at another level it is to the fore, and it's that unofficial level that it is to the fore. But the end product is negotiation because you know, no, no one wants to uh, go to court. Um, and again, the major negotiation, they just want the, the nuisance to stop. They don't want to go to court for compensation. They want money to be given to restock fish, etc. So it is heavily negotiated. And that is distinctive. You know, there are other ways of doing environmental law that are a lot more formal, a lot more yeah, uh, rules-based a lot clearer. Um, this way that I'm describing, if I'm right, is, it has, has none of those qualities of clarity, formality, etc. British way. Uh, why did Ashby choose the British way, uh, uh, the river, rivers pollution, to illustrate the British way? Because yeah, rivers pollution law unfolds within three separate jurisdictions. There's Scots law, <coughs> There's uh, Irish, Northern Irish uh, law, and there's the law of England and Wales. Uh, this is 1972 when he was um, you know, talking about the British way. Um, his argument is that um, although there are formal laws relating to three different jurisdictions, you know, hovering above that is this British way. They are all pretty similar. Um, so. Uh, but my point is, it's interesting that uh, the, the example he gave to illustrate the British way could be given as an example of there, there is no British way. There's a Scots way, there's an English and Welsh way then, and a Northern Irish way. 
Um, he chose, Ashby chose this example because the evidence suggested that whatever way Britain has uh, works quite well. The, the, these are, because there are three ways, there's Scottish ways and English ways, or rather the rules, and, and all those, there isn't a systematic UK-wide monitoring of uh, river quality. So these are the, the statistics for England and Wales. But Ashby could point to the fact that rivers were improving in quality through this way of regulating. Um, with 92% of rivers uh, unpolluted or, or mildly polluted in 1972, compared to 87 in 1958. So Ashby was impressed by the fact that regulators monitored water quality for a start. You don't just legislate to prevent pollution and then that's that. You, you, you make sure that there is an impact on the environment. But that impact suggested that things were um, on the right uh, trajectory going up, improving. But we'll come back to the, the you know, the eight percent that were polluted, um, because a lot depends on, you know, how urgent you want your environmental law to be. You know, can you be this, you know, casual or optimistic about improvement? Um, should one panic more? But anyway, that, that's, uh, that's 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 why he chose the British way, uh, the rivers pollution. Sorry, to illustrate the British way, because it seemed whatever way it was, it seemed to be working. Um, but he was also, Ashby was also interested in BPM, best practicable means. It disappeared uh, over recent decades for perhaps obvious reasons, um, but uh, um, we'll come back to those in a second. But Ashby liked the standard by which chemical factories and other factories had to operate. Parliament said that factories must use best practical means to prevent emissions to air, harmful emissions to air, and sometimes land and water as well. So the test here that Ashby um, um, focused on originated in the Alkali Act, 18, well, actually 1874, which repealed the um, 1863 Act, but an Alkali Act test of best practical means, a standard of best practical means. Um, and as you have in, have in the quote here, Parliament did not define what BPM was. So the courts couldn't really ever get involved in what BPM was, uh, which meant that the inspectors, the regulators, the executive body, they had that blank canvas as to what um, BPM was in the circumstances. So it's a brilliant example of the spontaneous, ongoing, case-by-case -case, um, uh, way that Ashby called the British way. I don't know if uh, there are um, uh, any questions. Um, th th this is clearly under this case-by-case -case approach uh, where the executive decides what technology is required by law. Uh, a lot of um, trust is placed by everyone in the regulator, in the executive body. Angus Smith was the uh, first uh, chief inspector of Alkali Works um, to handle BPM. He wanted BPM. He wanted a flexible standard by which he could work with factories to improve things over time. He described it as an elastic band that would tighten as technological innovation broke through. So, he wanted the authority, he wanted the power to make decisions on a case-by-case -case basis. But um, for him to succeed, he had to have the qualities that Ashby, in his uh, book with Mary Anderson, describes here. Um, he had to have Celtic qualities, including charm, benevolence, um, patience. So um, the British way of environmental protection, I think you could describe as very romantic because it rests on kind, wise, clever, in this context, men, but it, it could be people more generally. Um, rather than rational rules, laws derived from principles. So it's, you know, it's very uh, based on, on, on uh, individual executive officers and the wider executive to whom they're accountable. So let's move on to uh, criticisms of the British way of environmental protection. And one um, is this, this, this lack of urgency. Yes, it's good that uh, you know, 5,000 uh, miles of river turn from being 
very polluted to mildly polluted or unpolluted at all between 1958 and 1972. But there were still a thousand miles that are grossly polluted. You can't hold this up as a good way. It may be the British way, but it's the wrong way. It lacks urgency. You know, slowly but surely is slowly. Why emphasize the surely? Why not put the spotlight on the slowness of the process? So that's a, that's a, that's a significant you know, criticism to deal with here. And uh, um, some people are talking about the client earth litigation involving ambient air quality under the directive here, 2008, 50, in which three client earth cases against the government and local authorities resulted in um, orders um, against the defendants that required them to show more urgency in cleaning up um, air pollution hotspots. So the client earth litigation um, in the context of the EU directive is that's good because it has the urgency that you require of a way of environmental protection. So I mean, I, I, I mean I, I've got a response to that that's here, but I almost I don't I don't want to. This is not about defending the British way, so I might come back to, to my response to that. But that that's a significant criticism that the British way uh, lacks urgency. Um, and that's a big problem. So a significant, a, a second criticism is that you can't, as lawyers, accept an arrangement in which executive bodies are making the law. It's unconstitutional. You know, Angus Smith, he had no legitimacy um, to make the law. Uh, Parliament should not have given him the broad discretion to say that that's allowed and that's not. Uh, the courts, because Parliament gave so much discretion, were kept out of the process as well. There's no rule of law, no opportunity for rule of law. This is executive environmental law. And uh, Liz Fisher was the most recent uh, uh, person to criticize discretion in the environmental context as unconstitutional. You know, you need executive bodies to be working within a legislative framework because legislation confers legitimacy without which, you know, the, 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 the process is unconstitutional. So that's, um, that's, an, that's another significant criticism um, of the British way to, to think about. And as I said, I won't, I won't defend uh, the British way, but just list, list these criticisms for the time being, see, see whether there are others as well as bad. So that's criticism number two of the British way. It's unconstitutional because it's about executive environmental law, closing out legislatures and courts. Um, a third major criticism is that it is insular. You know, environmental problems are global. They know no national frontiers. We, this may be participative in the sense it's drawing upon local communities who are affected on the ground, but it's very parochial. How about wider global picture? How about learning from you know, other jurisdictions? How about actually being part of a wider jurisdiction where there's a lot of intelligence there, like the EU, um, where the, the best practices are you know, uh, shared you know, among everyone? You know, why think that a nation um, can do something better than a group of nations. So that's, um, yeah, that's, that, that's, that's another significant criticism. I, I, I mean, I, I've, I've singled these out as the three most you know, significant criticisms. Uh, but then there may be, I may be missing something um, radically. And, and if I am, there's, you know, uh, there will be plenty of time for questions, but please, if you, if you feel there's a, the, uh, uh, an elephant in the room, um, I think those are, in my view, are the main criticisms. Um, so I, just, I will very briefly go back through my response to them, and then we'll talk about the future, what the British way, you know, what future it has <coughs> after 40 years of membership of the EU and 20 years of devolution. You know, um, is the British way, good or bad, alive? You know, should we be kicking it into touch? Or, or is it redundant? Is it anachronism? And then lots of people who've reviewed my book or face to face have said, well, it's an anachronism. This is 1972. You can't be serious about invoking a concept um, of 40 years ago. 
today. Um, so I'm going to come on to the future in a second, but let's, uh, here are my views of, of, of you know, the, the response to the criticism. The insularity of the British way. Um, um, the regulatory law that we've been talking about involving discretion, it's based on the continental model. So the Alkali Act's best practical means, it was you know, based on a review of what was happening in Prussia, what was happening in France. So you know, House of Lords uh, Select Committee, a Royal Commission on Noxious Vapors, they looked broadly um, at Europe in particular um, and you know, looked at best practice and felt this is the best way of doing it um, in the context of Britain. We can learn. Um, from, from elsewhere. So, and we talk about nuisance, it's based on Norman Roman laws, you know, secretary duo, it's just, these, are, these are European, these are cosmopolitan doctrines. So the British way of environmental protection that we've described is not just, you know, grown entirely on Scottish or Welsh or soil. It's, it is cosmopolitan, as a matter of fact. Um, executive lawmaking, well, there's two ways of looking at uh, power. Um, one is that you, know, you should have legal constraints on the exercise of power, as Dicey said, without rule of law, there's just rule by man. You know. The other is that, hang on, you know, law and judges, they are political actors. So why should you allow judges to make political decisions or be engaged closely in a political process when they aren't as accountable as executive bodies. So the response to this criticism is that executive bodies are more easily accountable um, to the people than judicial ones. Uh, and you would not want to really add to the accountability of judicial. You would not necessarily want judges to be elected in the way that... You know, you get the picture. So the defense of this is that political constitutionalism is, is as valid as legal constitutionalism. You know, there are two ways of doing this, and the British way does it one way. Uh, critics of it are advocating another, but it's very hard to say which is right. And personally, it's a question of where you lean. And I lean and more and more towards the, the, the Griffiths model, the political constitutional model. And it's very interesting that um, Lord Sumption is giving his, bless has given his blessing to the Judicial Power Project. Um, a, a, number of, um, a small number of academics in London are, are re-examining. They're, they're taking the view that the Supreme Court um, is overreaching, it's, it's overstepping its, uh, its power. It's, it's creating a common law constitution based on its independence from political processes with the Lord Chancellor being sort of you know, taken out, losing their power. Um, um, under the uh, Constitutional Reform Act 2005. So there is a serious project of re-evaluation of the role and power of the judiciary. And I think the British Wave of Environmental Protection, um, you know, it's, it's an opportunity for it to sort of stand up and say, well, this, this is, if you're worried about judicial power, then, then this, this is what you can do. So, um, and lack of urgency, um, uh, the client earth litigation did involve EU law. EU law required um, air quality in relation to, say, nitrogen dioxide to be brought into line with WHO guidelines legally, you know, as soon as possible. Um, but it wasn't the European Commission that was enforcing these standards. It was client earth, a UK charity. It was civil society, domestic civil society. And the legal institution was not uh, the ECJ. At some stage, the UCJ gave a very woolly response to a reference. It was the High Court. Um, so this, I think, is, uh, this is the urgency is coming largely from domestic institutions. And leaving the EU is not an end to the jurisdiction of the High Court. And it isn't an end to client earth. If anything, it can breathe uh, life into them. So um, I've been talking for a long time at you. I mean, have got, I'm moving on to the future now. I'm looking at uh, EU withdrawal and devolution. And I'm going to try and argue that the British way of environmental protection has been strengthened by 40 years of EU membership and by 20 years of devolution. Um, um, this, is, I've, this is not in, in the book, this is something I've sort of been reflecting on, watching the debates about devolution um, in recent months and about leaving the EU.
So I think the British way is stronger than ever. Um, so uh, this is why I think it's stronger after 40 years or more of EU membership. Nigel Haig, a very pro-EU um, uh, commentator. I mean, he, he, he played a big part in the, the drafting of the single European Act with the environment chapter. Uh, so Nigel Haig um, pointed out that uh, the British way, or British style, or thinking British, really only came about with internationalism. The fact that the United Nations Environmental Programme was founded, where Britain applied to have the headquarters in London and went to Nairobi, got Britain thinking about its place internationally in relation to the environment. Britain rather than local authorities, London, Bristol, Edinburgh, and what have you, capital cities. So Haig's argument is that the internationalization of environmental policy and law created uh, an emphasis or uh, an impetus for Britain to think of what, what does it stand for? And of course, it was Britain as a whole that was a member state, or the UK as a whole that was a member state. So, so being a member of this uh, large organization, he strengthened national institutions. So it's a very simple argument. Um, that um, uh, membership of the EU has strengthened national institutions. Um, uh, yes, many civil servants who would have been focusing um, uh, on domestic issues have been seconded to European ones. They're, they're part of a broader shared, you know, 27 other member states uh, enterprise. You know, DEFRA is, is, is not quite so equipped, perhaps, um, as it w was when it was the Department of Environment. Um, earlier in, in, in the, the e, EC journey. But the, whole, the, the, the point is that um, before membership of the EU, uh, policy and law was much more local, much more localised. Um, and during um, the EU journey, um, Britain has you know, participated in a range of different ways. These last ones here are examples of the um, UK saying, well, this is how you do it and it being done that way. So the Water Framework Directive is largely modelled on the British way of environmental protection. It's about overall, an objective of overall good status for water courses, like wholesome. What does good mean? It's a qualitative, vague notion. You know, all rivers should be, or water bodies should be good, and how you arrive at that is on a case-by-case -case basis, looking at river basins. So the Water Framework Directive is the British, you know, it's modelled on the British way. Um, the Integrated Pollution Prevention Control Directive, the first one, 1996, that's modelled on the Arclay Acts. The control of Leblanc works under the uh, 1881 Arclay, etc. Works Regulation Act, which required um, factories to use best practical means, best practical means to prevent pollution of air, land and water. So these are examples of, of Britain shaping EU law positively. But there are probably more of, um, of a different kind. So sometimes the EU, because of the British way, has vetoed proposals. So there's no soil directive because Britain was almost alone in, in opposing this. Um, and there's no, um, there was a, um, um, the, 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 um, the draft directive on civil liability and damage caused for, um, by waste, which would have impacted on the common law relating to nuisance. That was vetoed um, by um, you know, uh, British, diplomats. And, and a lot of the directives um, that have been reformed have been reformed to make them more flexible, more case by case, and less formulaic, less formalistic, less rigid, dangerous substances in water um, being a really clear example. Um, so um, that's, that's why I think that EU membership has strengthened the, the British um, way, because it focuses attention on Britain as a whole, and during the journey, uh, the British way has been vindicated in the things that have been stopped, in the changes that have been brought about, and in the new things that have come based on um, a practical, flexible uh, model. So devolution is going to be the more um, hard, hard, hard argument to sell. How can it be that a British way is strengthened um, by devolution? Um, which has had, in some respects, the opposite effect of EU membership, because EU membership has strengthened the UK institutions, uh, moving away from localism of before to you operate at an EU uh, national unit. But devolution has devolution has taken a lot of political 
um, authority away from these central institutions. So um, we're seeing at the moment um, that um, uh, it's very difficult for um, UK Parliament to enact UK-wide environmental legislation. We have a UK Environment Bill um, that was put before Parliament, read a second time in October. Um, we think it's going to come back at the end of this month. Um, but although it's a UK Environment Bill, almost all of it applies to England only. And UK ministers, insofar as there are shared powers or exempt, ex accepted powers or reserve powers. Um, but the reserve powers, the accepted powers, you know, they're all up for grabs. You know, um, Scottish and Welsh ministers are saying, well, these, these, are, our, you know, these are our field. So um, my understanding is that the UK Parliament um, is impotent. Um, um, it can't do much in the environment field at the moment. Uh, Scottish Parliament can, Welsh um, legislature can, uh, Parliament at Westminster can in relation to the England. Um, now that Northern Ireland um, uh, the evolution is up and running, that, that's looked after there. But there's, there's, no, there's no clear legal framework bringing the UK uh, together such that there can be a British way of environmental protection that flies. Um, but the key part of the British way of environmental protection is the limited role played by law. What makes the, the way of environmental protection in Britain British is that the law is only one part of it and politics is a much bigger part of it than elsewhere. So what you have here, instead of legislative uh, approaches to environmental governance and environmental law, uh, you have political ones. There are going to be, I see, many more understandings, concordats. You know, it's going to be a much more political process um, in which, you know, yeah, that, 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 that's my argument. And that is not the EU way. It's not a, a, a continental way. It's not an even American way. It's, it's a very British way of, of, of doing things in, in, in terms of um, Ashby said. I'm going to give one last little example here, and this is uh, from, on that field. It's about um, enforcement of environmental law as Britain you know, moves away from the EU. So England, um, or rather what the Westminster Parliament, is going to be giving England uh, uh, an OEP, an Office of Environmental Protection, to enforce environmental law through a new process, a bit like judicial review, called environmental review. So England is going to have a European Commission-like governance arrangement to fill the gap left by yeah, the Commission. But uh, Scotland is not keen. You know, in the consultation and in a, in a, in a report by a Scottish Link on environmental governance, there is more of an interest in a flexible ombudsman-like approach to uh, environmental complaints. Um, you know, the European Commission was not an ombudsman. It was a watchdog you know, with you know, robust legal powers that you know, the courts it could go to had sanctioning powers. So Scotland is you know, you know, holding back from the gap-filling that England is doing. And Wales is as well, because it has its new institutions. SEPA is an old institution, but Wales has the natural, natural resources of Wales. It doesn't want to be adding a new tier of uh, you know, regulation to replace the Commission um, at this stage. Um, so, yeah, the, 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 the point here is that um, in a year or two's time, um, Britain will have a, a Commission like system for England. But the rest of the UK won't. So uh, it will be, there will be a more of a distance from um, the EU because of devolution than there would otherwise be. Um, okay, my, my last slide, and this is, this is, you know, this is uh, another Edwin Lance here. Uh, the British way of environmental protection treats, uh, you, know, you know, it doesn't have a beginning. It's an ongoing journey. When does it begin? Who knows? Bit like the, written, uh, the unwritten constitution it goes deep back in time, you know. So the British, uh, the, the British way of environmental protection takes a rather different view of wider nature than, say, the EU system, because the EU system started with the first action program in 1973, which was dealing with the problems of the day, you know, black boxing environmental problems. But um, uh, 
you know, it creates the impression of nature being very vulnerable. You know, nature is under threat from humans, we must do something about it. But the British way of environmental action, which is much more sort of ongoing, organic, you know, I think it has, it has a view of nature that Edwin Landseer has in this uh, painting. Uh, man proposes, God disposes. This is about a Victorian exposition to Newfoundland, you know, going wrong um, and ending in uh, adventurers being eaten by polar bears. That's the view of nature that makes the British way of environmental protection certainly distinctive. Um, because you know, it's humans rather than wider nature that are the most vulnerable on, on this scheme. On that very cryptic note, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end, but uh, I do hope you can find some uh, questions to ask from that, uh, that jumble of uh, uh, observations. So yeah, thank you very much. Thank you.